been assisting me in the process, set up our Facebook page, and is going to sort Gary out tomorrow on Skype. I did get a nice little introduction out of Stephen, which goes, I could say that I'm an IT project manager by day, but also tinker with electromagnetic wave propagation in my spare time and he has a master's degree in economic policy. He's heavily allergic to dogs and cats, but has several of each in his home in Victoria. Thanks to the miracle of free market healthcare, well, any of you who are allergic better ask him about that. His wife and two teenage daughters like subjecting him to TV soap operas on a daily basis, but he gets back at them about telling them about the latest philosophical or science fiction audiobooks. He's been listening to. Them. He was born a libertarian, but he didn't know he was one until 1999, when he attended his first Libden. Says he accidentally uttered all the past phrases to our secret society on a Mensa email forum, where some lips of folks hung out and took notice. Since then, he's been involved the Libertarian Movement, and he coordinates the Pretoria Libertarian Dinners. So, with that, Stephen's going to speak to us about culture. Yes. It's going to be related somewhat to what, what the rest of our day is going to be about, which is really focusing on our own. I actually asked Francis to edit some of that, but okay. <laughs> 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 uh, Stephen, your thing is getting cut off a little bit on the side. Say again. Uh, I think it might be getting cut off. Yeah, yeah it does. That. Um, I think it will fix itself now. I'm um, trying to get the right screen here. <coughs> okay, so this is not present on the right screen. Just give me a second. There we go. And now I just need to figure out how the pointer works. I'll do this in a second. Yep, it's cutting off at the bottom here, but that's okay. We'll zoom in just now. And uh, the guys at the back won't be able to read. That's also fine. I've got about 500 slides, but. I'll go through them very quickly. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about culture. I think there's a bunch of misconceptions about culture. We use the word all the time, but I just want to uh, give you a little bit of insight into a presentation that I had to do for a, a corporate customer about a year ago, uh, which got me to thinking, do we really understand the word culture as such? Um, so this isn't my normal deep mathematical and uh, technical descriptions of stuff, which I, I like to do. Um, I'm just going to play around with the word culture a little bit so you can relax, sit back and uh, just watch the thing happen. Okay, so first of all, what is culture? Is culture defined by language? So if you uh, speak Dutch, you're Dutch. If, you're, if you speak French, you're French. Or is it more than that? Uh, has it to do with your location in your country? So if you live in Gauteng, then that's your culture. Or if you live in South Africa, that's your culture. How do we actually define culture? Or is it around your sport? The, if you watch rugby, you're South African. If you don't, you're not South African. Um, or is it about your food, what you eat? Uh, so if you don't eat cook sisters, then you can't be Afrikaans. Right? Um, or does it have to do with your behavior? So if you put fur in your dash, you must be from the East Rand, right? <laughs> I can say that because I'm from there. <laughs> I don't have fur on my dash, I miss it every day. <laughs> okay, or is it genetic? So if you're from Irish origins, does that mean you're Irish even though you're living somewhere else, eating different foods, playing different sports? Okay, so the Wikipedia definition of culture is it's the ideas, customs, and social behaviors of a particular people or society. So we're talking about a particular people or society, but it doesn't say anything about borders, and it doesn't say anything about your genetics, it doesn't say anything about 
actually anything tangible. It's ideas, customs, and social behavior. So it's how we act and the stuff we do uh, that defines your, the culture. So if I just zoom out a little bit, two of those things don't fit that definition. So we associate all of these things with culture to some extent. Two of them don't fit. Um, any suggestions of which those would be? Okay. Location and genetics. Yeah. Location and genetics. Incidentally, those are the things you can go and scientifically measure. You can see if the guy's inside the board or outside it. And you can go and pull his blood and see what his genetic heritage is. The rest of it is a bit more intangible. And those are actually the things that define the culture, right? So this is a few implications, um, but I just want to show you a little bit more around uh, where the borders of your culture sit. One thing is that cultures influence each other. So in South Africa, Afrikaans culture, uh, we have some very beautiful genetics and uh, some Dutch Reformed church influences. Uh, so there's a very strong Dutch influence, but there's also Mediterranean influences. So we eat Portuguese rolls and Greek salads and all of this stuff. So uh, there's Mediterranean influences in our culture. There's also French influences, uh, pancakes and chips and all of this stuff. And, of course, some Malaysian uh, influences. I put some Bubuerti down there, which is very tasty. But that reflects even in our names. So, uh, my name is Lund von Jarsfeld. It's an English first name, originally actually Greek, with a Dutch surname. Uh, if you call Johannes Beatrice Lutoy, it means your first name is Dutch, your middle name is Greek, and your last name is French. So, all of these cultures influence each other to build up the culture that we have. So besides the borders being a bit fuzzy, you also get overlaps. So I took the example of the British Isles. You've got the Welsh. Uh, I have the picture upside down. The Welsh is supposed to be at the bottom, right? So between the Welsh and the Irish, there's a bunch of crazy bikers, and they go racing around an island once a year. And between uh, the Welsh at the top, and you can't really see the British at the bottom, there's a bunch of Druids in the middle. We sort of look at all of these uh, people from Viking descent and uh, we just see them as the British Isles. But there's a lot of overlap. There's different cultures inside those islands. And these people act in different ways and do different things, uh, eat haggis or don't eat haggis. Um, we look at them and say British Isles. So you have to be a bit careful when you talk about culture. It could overlap, it could influence each other, it might not be as clearly defined as we might think sometimes. So the borders are a bit fuzzy in this whole culture of thing. So this is what I actually put in for my corporate client. Uh, it might not be that relevant here, but uh, let's do this quickly. The question of where the borders sit in your culture starts to influence the question of who are you really and where do you fit in. So do you stop being Zulu just because you wear a, a suit and tie? Or uh, do you stop being of Malaysian descent because you don't eat with chopsticks? Or uh, in this case, is this car in the Vele or German? It's sometimes hard to say. Or, I wrote down the bottom there, you won't read, be able to read it. Will your Englishness be revoked if you eat pop and wash from a blood board? Okay, um, that's just questions that come up when you say the culture is a bit fuzzy, uh, not as tangible. So, do you stop being Afrikaans because you speak to somebody in English on your iPhone that was made in China and designed in, designed in California? There's also other cultures other than linguistic and food and sports. So, you have a biker culture, guys driving to uh, <coughs> the northeastern parts of Pretoria to have a little check on a Sunday morning. Uh, or pilots or accountants. Uh, we were talking in the car on the way here what specific kind of culture accountants sometimes have. Okay, so those obviously overlap with other cultures. So you might be an Afrikaans accountant or you might be a Greek accountant. But the accountants have something in common. So there's an accountant kind of culture as well. Okay, so there's a bit of a question around who are you really when you start looking at the definition of culture and you say it's mainly behavior based and the borders are a bit fuzzy. So within us, there's also a lot of diversity. So I'm going to try and paint you a little bit of a picture which fits into our libertarian way of thinking and hopefully doesn't disrupt your traditional way of thinking also too much. First of all, the point is that culture is not geographic. Um, here we've got a boy actually in, of obviously African descent, but living in South America and learning Dutch 
uh, in Suriname. So that's a whole bunch of cultures influencing that, that situation there. There's very little South American in this picture, actually, except for it being in South America. So culture is not really a geographic thing. Okay. Um, culture is also not uh, genetic. So I happen to be mostly of Irish descent, apparently. Um, but even though your genes can influence your behavior, it doesn't determine your behavior. I don't know if you guys know the sport. It's a very Irish uh, sport, I think, called Hurley. Hurley. <laughs> Berlin, you see, I can't even pronounce it right. So much for genetics. And uh, no culture is exclusive, pure, isolated, all by itself, and stable. So if one example is which culture is famous for playing baseball or really likes baseball, Japan. any guesses? Japan and yes. Yeah, Japan. <laughs> baseball is really big in Japan. Okay, and uh, culture is not as, as clearly and easily defined as it, as it used to be in the past. It used to be a bit simpler, but uh, our labels are changing. There's a lot more aspects to our lives these days. There's a lot more overlap than there used to be. So because of all of this, you can be brought up in particular ways with mixed family, uh, with all sorts of uh, different ways of looking at, at your culture. And in this, it's important to remember that all of us wear Western clothing, buy Chinese products, um, look at uh, American entertainment, and all of this stuff. So to keep your own identity is sometimes a bit difficult, but we're all individuals and have different combinations. So what I'd like to point out today, and this is sort of the point of my very short uh, presentation, is that because of this fluid nature, you might feel uncertain about the culture that you slot in, but we all have a few primary points that we identify with. If you go and focus on the differences between people, and you say, what's the difference between me and you? Uh, you don't need cook sister, so I'm not interested in having anything to do with you. You miss out on a lot of cooperation, and you end up just being a bunch of individuals. If you focus on the similarities and you say, we're both accountants, we can cooperate in a business on this project, uh, you'll have a lot more to do with each other. So my message today is, based, is very sim simple. Culture is not quite as tangible as we might think it is. But if you focus on the similarities and you use that, uh, we can achieve quite a lot more than we do by isolating. Because you will find ways to differ from other people. There are so many overlaps and differences that you will never be able to cooperate with other people if you just focus on that. That, that's a, a brave talk given by an Afrikaner in Iranian. <laughs> given that um, Iranian is defined around the concept of the culture of Afrikaners. Um, do you think that is a mistake that Aronia makes? No, I don't. And that's, so I have another speech this afternoon which is a bit more technical, where I'll explain how over time people tend to specialize in trade, um, and I'll explain the mechanism around that. So that's going to be a bit more in-depth. But it's definitely not a mistake. It's a sort of a natural progression. So, and that's, but I'll explain that this afternoon. Uh, um, if it wasn't that I was late this morning, I would have been uh, more prompt with putting up my hand uh, uh, and, and be the first to speak. Uh, I'm from Arania, and, and I uh, keep myself busy with, amongst other things, questions about culture and the way in which Arania is a cultural community, etc., etc. And all I wanted to comment is that um, I think this is a very good presentation. A very balanced handling of these uh, complex issues of what makes up culture. So uh, congratulations from that point of view from uh, an Urania insider. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, okay. um, thank you for the acknowledgement. Um, so tell me something, just when, when you were mentioning there on, um, you know, on, on people, on, on focusing on the similarities versus the differences, uh, when we get weird sort of like cultural events, I know the English had I think more than one on, on some of their colonies where they had integrated sort of like cultures where the skin tone went from like pretty white to pretty darn dark 
and where they sort of like I think they did in North America to my knowledge they did it in the Cape where they sort of like cut off half of this thing um, obviously like a very extreme example was was um, you know Germany uh, with the whole Aryan thing w w where do you think that thing sort of like gets inflamed and becomes septic and like just gets a life of its own so it's it's interesting because that's where this afternoon speech actually comes in is there's a number of aspects and I'm only focusing on the most difficult one actually. I'm taking Ricardo's comparative advantage and I'm showing the economic benefits of integrating in a specializing in trading. So that's part of it. So you have to think then if you've got various different economic incentives to cooperate, be nice, trade with other people, um, you know, have a community like Urania, for example, where you... S Let me leave it for this afternoon speech, that portion. But there's a lot of economic incentives to actually cooperate with others. So you have to ask you the question, where that doesn't happen, why does it happen? This is why those economic incentives. The only reason I can see at this point is like, for example, that there's political influence. So there's somebody who wants power, political power, not economic power, well, maybe they want economic power as well, but they try to get that through political power. So where you see uh, cultures being s deliberately split up, or split up, it would be deliberately typically, and it would be through use of, of force and power rather than through economic incentives. There's a strong economic incentive, or various economic incentives, for people to cooperate and be nice to each other. Um, and to influence each other in a natural way. Where it happens unnaturally, obviously, that's typically the use of force and governments are involved. Um, we can talk about how that happens, but I think we're all sort of inclined to, to get there. Yeah. Yes, uh, you remind me of Kenneth Clark, who did a very famous TV series, and I think everyone hasn't seen it, and I strongly recommend trying to get it, I think it was in the 80s, called Civilization. And uh, the question he asked was, what does he mean by civilization? It was a series on civilization. And he had a, a, an extraordinarily fascinating definition that's haunted me ever since, which is he said, I don't know how to, how to define it, but I know it when I see it. And uh, a culture is a bit like that. It's, it's very odd. For example, a very close friend of me, I don't know, a libertarian guy called Terry Markman, uh, is a Jew. Now, what does it mean to say he's a Jew? He's an atheist. He doesn't have any Jewish conventions. He doesn't go to synagogue. He eats bacon. Uh, you know, so whatever. But he's still very clearly a Jew. And he thinks of himself as a Jew. And so, and I think it's the same thing again. It's very difficult to say what it is that makes him a Jew. Uh, but you know it when you see it. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, I think that's, puzzle. That's something that I've picked up I, I've, this is my second time to Iran, and the previous time I was here, what, what I picked up was it's sort of, a, you can self-identify and say, I'm part of the Greek culture, or I'm part of the Jewish culture, or something like that, or I like the accountant culture. Um, but the people within that culture, the other accountants might look at you and say, no, you're more of a project manager, or something like that, and eventually those things tend to sort themselves out. So you can identify with the culture and still not fit into certain sections of it. Well, yeah, for example, if I can say, coming to Iranian for those of us who have never been here, we ask ourselves such, we have an idea of what we understand of the Kama Iranian yeah. culture to be. Okay. So we ask ourselves such questions as, can I go to dinner in shorts? <laughs> uh, Francis says to me, do you think I could wear this dress in Iranian? Uh, and, the, and you have no idea why, but you can say yes or no. So there is a degree to which culture is very conspicuous, very obvious, and yet extraordinarily, if not impossible, extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to define in any coherent yeah, Exactly, way and that, that I think is my central point, is it's, it's very complex, and it's quite often a subjective thing where you have to say, do I, do I feel like I fit in here? And quite often it's just a feeling. If, if you feel uncomfortable, you're probably not part of that culture. Mm -hmm. And you can't really define it more tangibly than that. Mm -hmm. Ayana? Stephen, do you not also feel that there are and the influences of various cultures on you and you? But is there not also various, for lack of a better word, levels of culture? So I, mean, I could be more defined as 
from the Zulu culture, but there is a South African culture. There's a time aspect as well, it changes over time. And it depends on what situation you're in, whether you're going to identify more with what... So, yeah, I, I speak about culture and libertarianism and economics and all of that stuff, but on Monday morning it's been going to be all schedules and uh, resources like that. So if I can just add, the question then becomes, um, what is better? Should, should uh, cultural diversity be encouraged from a point of view that we can be unified in our cultural diversity? Or do we mold into one culture called a South African culture? I think if you look at it from this perspective, the, it's, it becomes a, a nonsensical question to think that you can integrate cultures. Mm. Because you can't even define the culture in the first place. No, so how are you going to integrate yeah. Yeah. Isn't it like saying, should we have regulation of all um, television and radio stations of one regulator or multiple producers of things? Because culture seems like a market in which each of us is part of several sub-markets, several sub <coughs> sub-sectors, and we fit in and out of different cultures all the time, don't we? It goes even deeper than that. Uh, to use your analogy, uh, it's like people who only read papers and then to want to uh, regulate the television market uh, or have a, a state-controlled television broadcasting, but there's still Twitter and the internet and a whole bunch of other forms of media. Uh, you well, everyone really must go to church on Sunday, no one may wear a tie. Let's go over here for the next I'd like to make a statement, maybe we can discuss it or can agree or disagree. And I think it applies to Iran and clearly to me. Having a strong sense of your own culture makes you recognize and appreciate other different cultures in the world. That's interesting because I, I actually changed this mm -hmm. slide, this is the third time that I'm presenting this. And the, in the original, I said exactly that at the end, so where I had the five bullet points on okay. it, said exactly that. Uh, Trevor? I, I believe that your culture is not based on any of those aspects that you put up on the screen. It's entirely personal. It's that aspect of yourself mm -hmm. which you value most highly. And you can have multiple cultures at different levels simultaneously. So my culture, first and foremost, is probably libertarian. But I'm, as a secondary culture, I'm a volleyball player, and as a like a twentieth culture, I might be a South African rugby supporter. Mm -hmm. But there's a scale of values, and they're defined by yourself. They're not defined, in my opinion, by the environment in which you find yourself. So this is where people feel very uncomfortable with uh, vague definitions. They want to clump people together and say, "There's Rania, and it's a bunch of Afrikaans people." It's not. It's a it's individuals all trying to do different things. Some run uh, workshops, some uh, plant uh, wheat. food or wheat. Uh, some run a resort by the river, uh, which is very nice, by the way. Um, I'm always impressed when I see that. So it's not, people like to classify things and clump them into big groups. And the further you stand away, the broader that brush becomes. So when you're in America, it's South Africa and elephants and light. When you come into South Africa, there's a very big difference between Gauteng and Mpumalanga and the Free State. When you get into Gauteng, there's a big difference between Pretoria and Joburg. Mm -hmm. So it depends on your perspective. Once you get to the individual level, like you said, then there's a, very, a more granular level where you say, okay, firstly, uh, libertarianism, then volleyball, then so on. But how strong a fact is language? Um, it's, it depends on what you're looking at because, for example, in a pilot culture, everybody's going to use uh, the phonetic alphabet and basic English command, uh, regardless of language. Um, in the radio electronics kind of culture, there's scientific mathematical language, so it doesn't really make that big a difference. In other places, language would make fundamental difference. Um, Just to add to that point, um, the United Nations, um, or rather, uh, the South African Constitution, Section 235, we're um, really that from the Cape Party, pushing for Cape for Tony, uh, <laughs> also the supply, <laughs> uh, for Rania. Um, the, yeah, they define it as a territorial entity that shares a common cultural and linguistic heritage. So, place, mm -hmm. culture, language. I think language is very important. 
Um, and certainly from a legal standpoint, the United Nations would sanction um, a, a self-determination based on language. I, I'm a bit skeptical about that definition because it's convenient for the guys doing the defining simply because they can easily get around the borders where culture actually has nothing to do with the border. Um, so it's easy to go from that definition to the conclusion that language is important but it just happens to be the majority and there's still a bunch of minorities in there which is at an individual level they have their own culture. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm no fan of the United Nations. <laughs> and, and just to give a counter example to that, why I think, I, I don't, fantastic speech. Um, I'm trying to work out what's the conclusion here. It's, I think you, you, you've given a very broad definition and I think that's why we give so many different... I deliberately did that and I just want to take two questions at the back there quickly. But the, I deliberately did that because I want you guys to think about culture through the rest of the day the definition of culture and the word is going to be used a few times and then this afternoon I'm going to address part of that and make it a bit more tangible again and bring it back down to the individual level because that's us libertarians believe in individual rights and freedom of choice and all of that stuff. So I'm going to bring that back this afternoon but in the meantime I wanted to create exactly that feeling of uncertainty. Oh, this culture thing is a bit more vague than we thought. But the fact that... <coughs> my, my name is Andrew. Sorry, the... the Okay. Sorry, Andrew. Okay. And then, does it give any insights to look at how people vote all around the world? And apparently, survey after survey all around the world finds people vote first on religion, second on language, third on ethnic group, fourth and a long way behind on class, and last of all by miles on policies. So, in, in Northern Ireland, on Northern Ireland, for example, which I'm, my, I'm of Irish descent. Is purely religion absolutely overwhelms the the, the voting patterns. It, it's interesting because I I read a piece the other day where they said since women started voting in the United States, yeah. uh, the results have become much more leaning towards the Democrats and the Liberals. So there's also a male versus female thing, yeah. and you could actually because it's still remember our definition here. Let me just go back to the beginning quickly. The definition is the, let me zoom into that, because I we're talking about behavior, is my mouse point Because we're talking about ideas, customs, and social behaviors, it's not based on even your, your race or your sex, which means if you bring a different kind of vote in, like you let women start voting, um, you'll change what the way people act and behave and ideas and customs and all of that stuff. And that's what they use as basis for voting. So you actually change the dynamics of the voting. Sorry, the person at the back there has been waiting for a long time. <laughs> I was uh, thinking about uh, some things which might seem to be culturally um, neutral, <coughs> like being uh, ethnically neutral, not culturally neutral, like the uh, example of accountants. Mm -hmm. But uh, accounting as such, uh, is such a product of the Western culture, which expanded all over the world because of its obvious usefulness. So being an uh, Oriental accountant is much like being an Occidental samurai. Um, uh, we just do not view it that way because we regard it as 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 neutral because it's the the way we are working all along. And connected with that, uh, I'm also from Urania. Uh, we have a tendency to resist nation building, also for obvious reasons. But if you think about it carefully, some measure of nation building is essential for cultural diversity to survive. Because if, uh, as Afrikaans speakers in South Africa, some impulse didn't uh, bring us together as Afrikaners, then we would still have been the Makwalanders and Waterbergers and Karua people and so on. And Afrikaans would never have evolved to the level it had. Uh, because each one would be too small. And I'm thinking about the many uh, other indigenous languages in South Africa. And sometimes I wonder, might it have been useful if uh, all Nguni speakers devised a kind of let's say synthetical Nguni language and one Sutu language uh, which could also uh, evolve to that level. In the final instance 
and the Makwa land that is still very uh, recognizable on accent and, and vocabulary, mm -hmm. but they learn standard Afrikaans in order to go to university and to understand the news <laughs> and stuff. Um, and, and that might be useful for <laughs> <laughs> African languages, uh, also to a certain extent of nation building, so that there are not this multitude of languages which might be interpreted as... Uh, exactly, so I think, I think that's a very, very good point, because nation building is important, otherwise we would all just be individuals. So you have to find that kind of balance where uh, it's okay to all be individuals, but at some stage we have to cooperate as well and say, how do we share and interact? But when that's forced on you and you say everybody just has to be generic, like Maori in China, everybody has to wear little brown uniforms and that with a star on it, uh, that becomes very, very dodgy because you kill certain cultures and efficiencies and it's the use of force that Skalp was talking about. So when you force that, you, you end up with a whole bunch of detrimental effects, uh, especially economically, and I'll talk about the economic implications this afternoon. But uh, culturally, it's you have to find a balance between looking at the individual and appreciating all those various differences inside, but at the same time, specializing and sort of bringing together, but not in an artificial, forceful way, because that causes trouble. Sure. Um, I got a kind of automatic reaction uh, for me, so what? <laughs> what does it matter if a language dies or not dies? Mm. What does it matter? We don't speak Latin anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we don't speak the same Afrikaans that we did 50 years ago. Quite the very yeah, defining it. Just let things go. Things will happen in spontaneous order. Mm -hmm. will organize the way that we interact, that we trade, <coughs> that we marry, that we do things. We don't have to. And trying to define it scientifically, borders, what is culture, what is not culture, you can do it from an intellectual, intellectual exercise point. But in the end, don't try to control it, don't try to make it, it's and especially then don't use that force in, in order to achieve some sectoral objective. Mm -hmm. Quite a right for a while, and then Gavin, and then we're almost quicker as a method to find out what culture is regarded as being uh, factor analysis. Uh, you need to break up the overlap, yeah, quantify overlap. overlap. Is, is there a general factor? Is a number of, of group factors? Is there, you know, would, which of these components? Uh, provides the biggest explains the most variance and so on. Yeah. Okay, we should do some number of on, on what, what people regard as culture. That, that's actually interesting, and we can maybe use some prediction markers for that. Uh, I was wondering if your message isn't that the various components and artifacts that make up culture happen to be very contextual in the, on, the, on the basis in which you're using them. Mm -hmm. If you're using them in a, in a certain context, they can be unifying. If you use them wrongly in context, they can be divisive. For example, if you are trying to set up a new nation state, you might want to select, if you have to choose boundaries, that include religious, language, and, and various other elements to rather than sort of put borders between two groups like that. And there may be an open borders so people outside the borders can flow in and out. And then we're using culture in a more micro-cosmic thing, like with your auditors, your bikers, or whatever, then those cultural elements that are appropriate to that set or in that context function. I, I think so that's... So about the contextual basis of the discussion. I think there's a much... What Shaul was saying is there's a natural way that that will happen. Mm -hmm. For me, it's so intangible and undefinable that you can't go and artificially do that even if you wanted to. So you'd want to get to that point, but you need to leave it to have it happen. And I'll explain one of the incentives this afternoon of how that happens. But you need to leave it to happen because if, even if you try it, you can go and put a border, but there's somebody going to be in, on the eastern side of the Berlin Wall who wanted to be on the western side, mm -hmm. and vice versa. I heard at, apparently three people actually defected to North Korea last year. I mean, <laughs> what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it's not up to me to listen. Um, I think